I'm a massive fan of the thoracic paravertebral block. Um, the problem is, you can talk about paravertebral blocks at conferences and, and, and things like this, but then people don't necessarily have the confidence to take those skills elsewhere. And as a result of that, there have been a number of researchers who've been coming up uh, with alternative access points, potentially, to the paravertebral space. Uh, and one of the biggest game changers recently, I think, and we're going to see a lot of papers uh, coming up on that, are, is the erector spiny plane block. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through, sorry Dante, uh, the approach from superficial to deep. Uh, and I'm intentionally going to start out laterally. Uh, and I'm going to go, let's work out where we are. I'm going to go back here. So I've intentionally started out way lateral. I've got my probe orientated in, um, in this sort of parasagittal orientation. Um, we've got a very, very thin layer of adipose. And then we start to see some muscle layers. And what's beautiful, again, this is a beautiful machine. What's really nice is you can see three very clearly defined muscle layers there. Um, but before we get to the muscle, I'm just going to emphasize a point. I'm way lateral from the midline, so I know that I'm scanning over the ribs. So I do know that. So we've got. Um, trapezius, rhomboid, so trapezius is that top muscle right there, perfect, that's trapezius. Below that is the rhomboid muscle, and below that, again, we're going to start, we're lateral, so we haven't seen it at its biggest uh, size, is going to be the erector spiny plane. What I am going to do is I'm just going to scan down, distal, and can you see that beautiful tailing off of that middle layer of the muscle? This is significant because that is, you know, the rhomboid muscles end at about T7. Again, in terms, you couldn't have picked a better model, guys, so thank you for doing that. So <laughs> this is demonstrated. Trapezius, rhomboid, and as we go down, bam, that must be about the T7 level, rhomboid disappears. But what I'm going to do now is I'm going to slide from lateral towards the midline. So I'm definitely scanning over ribs. The intercostal space is between there. The intercostal muscles are there, and that's the pleura sliding. And as I scan towards the midline, bam, 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 the ribs are going to come down, they're going to come down. And then they're going to be replaced by a really sort of beautiful flat view there. So that view is a transverse process. Let's go lateral again. Rib. I'm going to keep coming towards the midline. Bam. Transverse process. And there you can see a really lovely view. Small, small adipose tissue, trapezius, rhomboid, a beautiful erector spiny complex. But what's really important to notice is when you're going lateral, erector spiny is not that big. So you need to be towards the midline over the transverse process to get that view. So now, with my, uh, with my view over here, we've got the perfect plane to do the erector spiny plane block. Now, when Ferrero um, and, and, and his colleagues, including Kijin, described it initially, their first approach was to inject local anesthetic above the erector spiny muscle uh, there. And then when their subsequent modification on that patient, when that patient came back to theater or came back to the clinic, they then modify the injection technique by injecting below the erector spinal muscle, just so one right there. So right on the level there where the transverse process is, and they aim to, to inject local anesthetic just above the fascia over there. So easy block to do. You can do it in the prone position, in the lateral position, or in the sitting position. I think uh, one of my uh, fellows, who's probably not here at the moment, Valentin, has changed my practice when teaching uh, trainees or residents. Actually, now I get all of my patients in the prone position. And the reason for that is you can see, although this is slightly tilted up, Dante's really stable. He's not going to move anywhere. I can give him sedation as required. And actually, when I'm doing ESP blocks, I give them maybe a milligram or so of fentanyl, or a milligram or so of um, midazolam, uh, and I don't give them any local to skin. It's a 22 gauge needle, or just pop it through, they don't need it. So, for an ESP block, all you need to do is you can, and you can needle. The initial description was from Kefalad to Kordad, but actually, it doesn't make a difference. It's a plain block. Um, so, you can inject the, the needle wherever you see fit. So, for example, in this position, I bring my needle in over here, uh, and you aim to pass through the muscles. And as you get to the posterior border of that uh, erector spiny complex, you inject a local anesthetic. When you're there, you get a beautiful black line just filling right above that plane. It's a really lovely place to put a catheter. Um, we've done this, we've, we've got a very small um, service here where we provide continuous catheters for patients uh, um, with pain issues on the ward. This is the block which I think most consistently is going to be reliable for, uh, for rib fractures. Um, and it's the type of block that I would be happy for somebody to do out of hours. Uh, so I think the erector spinal plane block has got many indications. But if you're thinking about rib fractures, we're talking about either serratus anterior um, or ESP. But actually, I've started using it for breast surgery. And uh, there's a few things that we're working on which are not been published yet. But I think, are you OK, Dante? Um, but I think this has got the, the potential to 
increase the, uh, the access of regional anesthetic techniques for patients having breast surgery? Because some of you guys don't necessarily want to go to the next level. 